Hello, my name is Doug Dorch, minister at Captiva Chapel by the Sea. Thanks for joining me today as we consider a brief message on warning what Jesus wants for us. A message that I hope will bring you some encouragement for your day. Some years ago, an American psychiatrist by the name of Carl Menninger wrote a thoughtful book titled, Whatever Became of Sin. I don't know that the book would sell that many copies today. Because in many circles, sin is not as popular of a term as it once was. That's because we like to think of ourselves as sophisticated people, people who have moved far beyond speaking of such archaic notions as sin. We prefer instead to talk about dysfunctions and neuroses, character flaws and human imperfections. But think about it for a moment. If no such thing as sin exists, and if all that ails the human race is something that can be cured with either therapy or the right medication, then the cross of Jesus Christ is not worth mentioning, and the good news of our faith is that God is nothing more than a doting parent, always in the wings, giving us permission to live as we please which is exactly what the powers of darkness want you to believe. Otherwise, the only alternative would be to believe that we really are ensnared by this ability never to do right, and the only deliverance from our fate is a Savior who counsels the power of that evil, which, when you think about it, is exactly what the Bible says. I invite you to consider the story that we find in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. It's a story that in many ways is more chilling than a Stephen King novel because it's so true to life. James and John, two of Jesus' disciples, two disciples who were brothers, approached Jesus with this remarkably brash request. Teacher, they say, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now, think for just a moment about how people who ask such things really regard Jesus. They see Jesus as a little more than a means to an end, as a way of accomplishing their heart's desire, and even worse, they assume, they assume that Jesus wants the same things they want. In other words, Jesus is their pawn. He's not their savior. Well, in this story, Jesus takes the brother's bait, not because Jesus is naive or needy, but because Jesus knows their hearts, and he seeks to help them know their own hearts. What do you want me to do for you? asked Jesus. It was a question that Jesus often asked people as a way of helping them to clarify what was at the center of their beings. Well, in this case, their desire, the desire of the brothers, was demonic. Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. In other words, make us important. Take us with you to the top. You know, the older I get, the more I understand the truth of the statement, be careful what you ask for. Because in this case, these two brothers have no idea what they're asking of Jesus. But as Jesus will tell them, the path to glory is also a path of suffering. In fact, the only other time in the Gospel of Mark anything is ever said of being at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus is when there are two robbers who were hanging beside Jesus on the cross. Mark tells us in the 15th chapter, and with Jesus, they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. You see, that's precisely the way sin works. Sin is always looking for a victim. For some reason, there are many today who believe they can do what they want as long as they don't hurt anyone else in the process. But that's precisely the problem with sin. Someone 
always gets hurt in the process. Look again at this story in the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel to James and John. Their request seems innocent. Grant us to sit at your glory. But what does Mark tell us? When the ten, that is the other disciples, heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. In other words, James and John never stopped to consider the consequences of their request in terms of the rest of the group. Because no one who ever falls into sin ever thinks about the consequences of their actions. You think the addict ever pauses to think about what his behavior is doing to his family? Or what about the unfaithful spouse? Or the business person who cheats on their taxes? Or the office worker who violates policies and procedures? Do they ever stop to think about what their actions do to the rest of the people in their community? Of course they don't. They can't. Sin has so dominated their thoughts and their emotions that all that matters to them is their good and nobody else's. Well, could you recognize such a person under the control of sin's power? Could you recognize such a person if you saw them in a mirror? This week I came across the story of someone who saw himself in that mirror and couldn't believe the person who was staring back at him. He tells his story with a question. Have you ever crossed paths with a real live atheist? I mean, somebody who is an atheist the same way that you consider yourself a Christian. Well, he says, I ran into such a person. When I met her, I thought getting to know somebody who lived her whole life, every minute, every day, without even a thought of God, well, that would be a real revelation for me. I figure that she must be strange and different like someone from another planet. But you know what I found out, he says? I found out there's not a dime's bit of difference between her and me. I found out she isn't somebody strange. She's just like your average, everyday, common-sense American like me. She never wonders what does God want me to do? Or what does God want me to know? Like me, she never loses sleep expecting God to come down and do something about the world. Like me, she just goes on about her life deciding on the basis of whatever's in her best interest, what's practical, what's possible. And I found out the person says that she could pass for me any time. So what does Jesus have to say about all of this? It's not the way it's going to work among you, he tells his disciples. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be the slave of everyone. Because the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, Mark's story invites us to look into the mirror and see the James and the John that lurks in every one of us, calls us to step into the shadow of the cross that is already lurking at this point in Mark's gospel, and to have the cross expose the loves and the loyalties that keep us from being the kinds of disciples that Jesus wants us to be. And most of all, most of all, it calls us to cast those loves and loyalties upon Jesus who was crucified to free us from their power and to release us to a better way of life. You see it throughout Mark's gospel in the first chapter, Jesus ransoms a man who is captive to demons. And then he ransoms another who's captive to disease. And in the third chapter, Jesus ransoms a man captive by paralysis. And in the fifth chapter, a woman who's been hemorrhaging for 12 years. They're all victims when they come to Jesus. But when they leave, they leave as people whom Jesus has set free. And the greatest deliverance is what Jesus delivered from the cross with its deepening shadows, its mocking bystanders, 
with criminals on the right and the left of Jesus. Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At Calvary, Jesus took upon himself the burden of our sins, and he released us from that burden with his broken body and his shed blood. As someone has said, there is a major difference between mere religion and Christianity. Religion is for people who are seeking to avoid hell. And Christianity is for people who have been there. Because God knows that in this world there are powers that would seek to keep us in bondage. But God gave us his only begotten son to ransom us and to set us free. And so in this life we must want what Jesus wants, no matter what it calls forth from us. So that as Jesus said from the cross to those on his right... Today you shall be with me in paradise. Thank you for listening today. Now you look to Jesus who delivers you from all your sins and even more delivers you to life abundant. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week.